So, um, Shing and I, Shingai, Shingai Mutasa, Shumba, we go a long way. Um, um, Shumba, I was talking to a young person yesterday who came to my office and said, he's very private. How does he manage to do it? I said, I don't know about you. To me, he's not private. I know him. Um, I, uh, his wife cooks for me all the time, and uh, that's why my tummy is like this. Um, Shingai is an amazing guy. Shingai calls me his president. I call him my loyal subject. He's one of those few people that I can bully in town. Um, Shingai has a beautiful mind, which I absolutely love. Shingai loves God. I have been witness of seeing Shingai being a rebel and then becoming a lover of God. Amazing man. Um, Shingai is of Bantu descent um, from the Mutasa kingdom. He's actually a prince of the Mutasa kingdom. Bano era Shumba. Um, Shingai started this entrepreneurial journey by asking a very silly question. How do I become a pound sterling millionaire by the age of 30? And you know what, what that, the answer to that is? He failed. It didn't happen. Um, then he changed and matured and asked himself a better question, a much more long-term question, a much more Focus question, a much more mature question. How do I make a difference in my country and on the continent before I go six feet under? Powerful question. Powerful question. Shingai, propelled by a clear long-term vision, he acquired a strategic stake in TA Holdings, uh, a diversified conglomerate, and transformed TA Holdings into Masawara PLC. Masawara has become big, uh, huge, and Shingai, we're so proud of you, absolutely proud of you, and we consider it a priv to be a privilege to have you amongst us. Shingai is passionate about building strong brands on the continent. You know, one thing I absolutely love about Shingai is, so Shingai and I have breakfast, one-on-one, uh, -on -one we have, and we put pictures on Twitter. And uh, then my, my, my sister invites me to the home to, to eat some lovely food, uh, oxtail and stuff, sadzare, zuyo, beautiful stuff. Um, what I love about Shingi is his long-term strategic thinking on things big and small. Long-term strategic thinking on things big and small. Um, how he built that tower out there, that sto his story just floors you. It's, it's, uh, and some of you I know have been saying, let's have Shingai on in conversation. I have tried, and I think I've finally won. He's going to be there very soon. Um, uh, Nick, I recognize you, my brother. Welcome, uh, Nick Vingirai, again, another giant. Um, <laughs> delighted to have Nick here. Uh, Nick, I don't know if you're here when we're gossiping about you, but they will tell you later on. With those few words, um, uh, Ruvenico, can I sit down now and say I give you Shumba. Thank you. Absolutely. My, my loyal subject. <laughs>
And you have to understand what that means. It means I'm the same person from Kenya all the way down to KwaZulu Natal, to Angola, to Mozambique, to the Congo. I'm a Bantu. And it's important you begin to understand the impact of that. But you must also learn why we think ourselves as one small little country when we are part of a community of six, seven hundred million people on this continent. I don't want to go below the concept of Bantu. The only other one is I'm a product of SADAC. I say that because you have to understand if we cannot think at scale, we will not amount to much. SADAC, 300, 400 million people in one community. The vision that I want to share with you today is that within the next 100 years, now, some of you may think 100 years is a long time. It's not. It's the passage from your grandfather to your grandson. It's not long. Within the next 100 years, I want Africa to be a full paying member on the table of nations. Now, some of you may say, oh, 100 years is too long. As I've grown, I've become more realistic with my timing. 100 years is achievable. For the younger generation, it may be 50 years. But it's important for us to understand the journey we must be part of. But I want to give you an understanding of Africa. Roughly 25% of the world mass is Africa. 25% roughly of the world's population is Africa. 60% of the world's arable, untapped arable land is in Africa. Over 45% of the world's strategic minerals reside in Africa. And yet, we as Africa contribute just over 2% of the GDP of the world. Just over 2%. All of those statistics render us 2% of the world's productivity. Although the rest of the world benefits from this imbalance, I strongly believe that there would be greater benefit if there was more balance in this world. I believe that a minimum African target in terms of contribution to this global economy has to be at 25%. And my goal is to try and stimulate us to achieve that in the next 100 years. Now, you may think that's a crazy number. 
China in 1980 was contributing 2% of the world's economy. And they could come up with statistics that I had. Today, 40, 44 years later, they're at 17 or 18 percent of the world's economy. So when I think about what we can do, I have no doubts in my mind if we get into the right mindset, it is possible. Africa must therefore begin to start focusing on seeking partners who see this and are keen to work with us. And we must begin to believe it is possible. You know, over the last 20 years, as I've gone to some of these conferences, there's always been this chant. Is Africa seeing the growing influence of China, and what is Africa doing about it? My view is very clear. In the late 70s, early 80s, Premier of China, Deng, said something that is still so profound to me says, I really don't care what the color of the cat is, as long as it catches mice. <laughs> Do you understand that? Yeah? Similarly, for Africa, I truly don't care who becomes our partner as they believe, as long as they believe in what we want to achieve. And it's very important, so when I hear these questions about what is China and what are we and should we not be careful, I genuinely think we're not listening to the cat and the color of the cat. Africa has a mammoth task ahead, a mammoth task. The task ahead is now how do we look for partners who are serious and committed about participating in the long-term economic benefits of our continent, thereby resolving the stark imbalance that exists in this world today. We must be clear Africa's problems are not the West. Africa's problems are not China. Africa's problems are not India or other nations, but ours and ours alone. Our challenges actually stem mainly from our mindsets. Not much else, just our mindsets. Each country and region has a different set of problems, but they all stem from the mindset. We must realize we are still following the edits of some amazing men. You know, these men met from October 1884 to February 1885. For those of you who know these men, it was part of what was called the Berlin Conference. What these men did is that they divided this incredible continent, literally, cigar 
cognac, and they divided our continent, this beautiful continent of ours. The reason they divided it, they said to each other, guys, there's just too much here for us to fight for, fight over. You know, Europeans, they love to fight. Hmm? But here, for some strange reason, they found unanimity and they stopped fighting over Africa because they split it, they split it together. What they have created and what they enjoyed was beyond their wildest dreams. The bounty that they have enjoyed out of this continent is beyond belief. So these amazing men, and it's not that I like them, but I respect them. Because what they created for their civilization has made them into the global force that they are today. The funny thing is, today, not last year, but today, 23rd May 2024, we still uphold the conversation that was had then. If you look at the map that those men created, and you look at the map of Africa today, there has been no change. It is the same map. And that's why I say they were amazing. Almost 200 years, 180 years from the day they met, we are still following what they created. It is time. It is time for us to begin to rebuild our continent. That's why I say I'm an African. I'm Bantu. And the region I operate from is SADAC. Because I do not want the divisions that were created in 1884 to pollute my mind. I keep going on about mindset. Let us bring it closer, closer to home. In our Sadak region, and in particular we in Zimbabwe, have to think deeply about our state of mind. No country or region, society, nation, or community can truly succeed without a clear capacity to believe in itself or have the capacity to self-exalt. Are you with me? Because the mind is the most powerful instrument that we have. And ours requires a reset. You know, this is why, for me, I learned there's a difference between being a colony and colonization. For us in Zimbabwe, we ceased to be a colony in 1980. This was a physical transaction. Hmm? Lord Solmes signed a piece of paper and acknowledged that they were handing over Rhodesia to Zimbabwe. 
and suddenly we were independent. But this does not stop the fact that we were still colonized. Unfortunately, we are still colonized. <laughs> Colonization is a mind issue and not a physical transfer of assets. It's a mind issue. You know, I like history. And one of the things that intrigues me is that when the British, and I, I'm sure the French too, but because I'm a colonial relic of the British, I tend to refer to the British. Yeah? But when the British refer to wars amongst themselves and their brethren, they use the words conquered or conquering or we were conquered. They were conquered by the Vikings. The Romans conquered Europe. However, when it is referenced to us, they don't use the word conquered. They use the word colonized. We were not conquered. We were colonized. If we're to succeed, we have to have a deliberate process of decolonizing the mind. Now, I can assure you, this is not easy, but it has to be done. Recently, I reviewed <laughs> my own state of mind, thinking that I'm way ahead and I'm beating this colonial, colonized mind. Then, when Trevor asked me to make this speech, I started to reflect. And I realized, in my own organization, the Cresta, group. Two of my prized, of our prized hotels are called Churchill and Jameson. And that's me. These two people who deliberately destroyed our history and participated fully in the colonization of our people and continent. Yet, I sit atop an organization where we proudly say, come to the Jameson, come to the Churchill. I can assure you, that won't last for much longer. We will change these names and we will glorify our own. However, I have no doubt, no doubt whatsoever, that there will be voices of negativity from our own that will say, Shingai, what's, what's the problem? But we will do it regardless. Self-identity. Self-identity is something that I'm passionate about. Who are we? How do we know who we are? Is it in the name? Just from the name, we will know who you are and how proud 
you are of yourself and your identity, just from the name. I want to give you an example so that you understand what I mean. Mr. John Smith, circa 1800, he decides to have five sons. And because he's creative, he calls them all John Smith. He sends one to New Zealand, another to Australia, another to South Africa, another to what will become Rhodesia, another one to the States. Fast forward, 2024. 220 years later. The one in New Zealand is so proud, pardon me, to be New Zealander. And he understands that the Maori are the original inhabitants. So in his passion, he actually learns to dance, the Maori dance. And in an equivalent way, the one in Australia, Rhodesia, America, South Africa, also becomes passionate about their countries and they become truly citizens of those countries. What's amazing is they are still called John Smith. Do, do you understand? Their identity, the pride in which when they shake your hand and says, I'm Zimbabwean, I'm a New Zealander, my name is John Smith. On the other side, you have us. Hmm? Not after 200 years, but after 100, 120 years, <laughs> we now call ourselves John Mutas, proudly. My name is John Mutas. My name is Lavmo Mutas. Now, what they will say is that our parents gave us these names. Hmm? Oh, it was my grandfather's name. Are, are you with me? It was my grandfather's name, so I must take it. The fact that their grandfather was forced hmm, to adopt an English name, a Christian name, sorry Trevor, they're forced to adopt Christian names. Does not register. Further, we believe that we must keep using these names because it will make it easier for our kids as they go into this world to communicate effectively. So we keep being called John David Smith, Mutasa. Now that is colonization, where you have gotten it into your minds that it is acceptable to be the identity of somebody else because you do not have any faith in your own identities. I have absolutely nothing but respect 
for John Smith, who lives in Zimbabwe and is proudly Zimbabwean. I have a problem with David Mutasa today, who says I'm a Zimbabwean, because that is not his full identity. Identity matters. And if we, as a people, are to become significant, we must be proud of whom we are. You know, the role of Zimbabwe, I strongly believe we are a gifted people. I truly, truly believe it. We are a gifted people. And we sit in a gifted Sadak region. And I want you to understand, my mind does not allow me to still ponder on the Mutasa kingdom because our vision is stronger than the two million people that my forefathers oversaw. Sadak is the minimum that we must, as our citizenry is, think of as Sadak. Our role in Sadak, I believe, is critical. And if we get our mindsets right, it will create a significant and incredibly positive contribution to the vision, because SADAC will be an integral part of the African vision. So what do we need to do? First, we have to strengthen our future generations, as they are the ones who will deliver the vision. We have to build a deliberate strategy over the next two or three generations to create a people who believe in themselves, their identity, and their capacity. We must strengthen our school curricula and it must be deliberate. What history must we teach? We have to teach African history. For me, there is more value in my children, my grandchildren, and the children that will follow learning about the Herero genocide rather than genocides in other parts of the world. Because I can assure you, in other parts of the world, they don't learn about the Herero genocide. So if they don't, why should we? We should learn about our continent. And I can assure you, our continent is so rich of history, so, so rich. We must teach African history from our perspective, not from somebody else's perspective, from our perspective. And I can assure you, if you want me to teach you about the Mutasa history, you walk away with the biggest head you can imagine, because I am so proud of my history. But I now know our history is one of many, many civilizations that have grown up on this continent that we have deprived ourselves of learning about. Our children must know about the kingdoms of Mali, the kingdoms of Ghana, Zambia, 
not the British monarchy. Hmm? And I have no problem about the British monarchy. Never get me wrong. But it is not relevant to the future of my children. It is not relevant to the future of Africans. Just as my kingdom is not relevant to them. Do you understand, guys? We must be proud of our language. We must build a language that becomes universal on our continent. And sometimes I wonder, why can it not be Swahili? Hmm? When I look at the Bantu, and I look at our languages, they are so similar. Hmm? They are so similar. Swahili is probably now the most spoken of Bantu languages. It would not be difficult for us to inculcate it to become the language. And I saw it in China. They speak Mandarin, all 1.4 billion of them. But you know what? In every province, they have their own language. For you and me, we won't hear it. <laughs> but they speak their own language. Hmm? So why can't we do the same? The next thing is we've got to strengthen our political leadership. You know, recently I studied two political parties. One, the British Conservative Party, and the other one was the Chinese Communist Party. Can you imagine the ideology of these two political party is, is, is like chalk and cheese. But there's something that I learned that makes both of them incredibly successful. And they are. When you look at what the Conservative Party has done over the last 300 years, you have to respect this party. And when you look at what China his Communist Party has done in the last 45 years is out of this world. So you've got to respect these institutions. The one thing that they do is they recruit the best and the brightest. They recruit the best and the brightest from a very early age. And this is what makes them successful. This is what makes those institutions successful. Our political parties must learn from this and recruit those young men and women. The long-term strategies to achieve our vision needs some of our greatest minds to think through, lead, and implement our future. The second one is our military leadership. What is interesting is our military leadership has already embarked over the last 15, 20 years on making sure that all their senior members went to college. That foresight is one we must respect greatly. However, they must now start focusing on recruiting brilliant minds, as warfare in the future will not be about sheer numbers, but the capacity to adopt, learn, and utilize artificial intelligence, Segur. <laughs> this is what is critical for the future, and we must encourage them to do so. There's just one point I want to make. 
which is the narrative. You know what the narrative is. Most of us do not control our narrative. So we quickly accept the narrative that we are given. In 2017, a military intervention took place. Do you hear me? A military intervention took place. Instead of glorying our military on the actions that they undertook, even though all of us were out in the streets, we seek somebody else's narrative. Rather than truly marveling at the intelligence, the discipline, and the clear capacity of our military, the narrative we follow is that of negativity. These actions could not have worked out so well without intellectual rigor and discipline. We must glorify this as it shows our capacity. And it's important you understand what I've just said. The last section is business. Our minds have to change. We have to help our political brothers and sisters to build this region. We are responsible. We should not leave it to them alone. And that is the one weakness that we in business have had. We sit back and watch and look on. But we have a role to play as business, an incredibly important role. And that is as business, not as politicians, but as business. My belief is that we must help embark on infrastructure that builds this SADC region into one. We have to get to a point, SADC, we are SADC. The mentality, the psychology, and the legality of SADC must be something we embrace fully, including our roads, our rails, and our power generation. If we think we're going to be successful without those four or five elements being at the forefront of our minds, we play. We have to help our government realize this. We have to help our Sadak brothers and sisters realize the same. We have to work through our universities. We have to build that capacity so that through the universities, we will develop products. Through the universities, we will create the revenues that allow them to become stronger and better. We must completely embrace AI, as this is the next stage of our evolution. However, I actually believe that the next stage after AI could and most likely will be delivered by Africans. Are you with me? Who could have thought that in 1980? You know, um, there used to be this, this image that uh, the international news agencies would show is 
they were showing China coming out of itself. And you'd see this image of Chinese people in Beijing riding bicycles, going to work. Hmm? And this was in stark contrast to what was going on in Europe and America. 40 years ago, this is what it was like. Hmm? Bicycles. Today, most of the electric cars that are made in this world are made in China. Today, it is arguably China or America who lead the world in AI development. 40 years. So we have a living example of what is possible. The big difference between China and Africa and ourselves is their mindset was correct. That's why the mind is the most powerful instrument that we have to deal with. We have to bring in global partners who want to build long-term relationships with us here in SADAC. There are just two organizations I want to highlight, just two. One is a group called Tsingshan. In Zimbabwe, they call themselves Dinsen. The actions this organization has taken, and it is a private company, don't be fooled to think, oh, no, no, government, but no, it's a private company. They have seen iron ore in our country. They've realized that 200 kilometers away, there's coke. They've also realized that there's limestone. And they said to me, you know, Shingai, it's amazing. With the quality of the iron ore and the coke and the limestone and the human capital that resides here, we are going to be the least cost producer of steel in the world. Do you understand that? In the world. Because their plant, their furnace, will be eight kilometers away from the iron ore. In China, they have to bring the iron ore 2,000 kilometers away. They have invested over half a billion dollars into this project. They are not yet 100% sure where the electricity is going to come from. To me, that is the kind of partner we must attract into our country because they are looking at the long term of our country. I'll give you a second one. Invictus. They have now found gas in Mazarabani. The quality of that gas is going to transform this country and some of the bordering countries around. They do that in spite of the fact that we're not yet sure whether the Zik will survive or not. They do that in spite of the fact that there are sanctions in our country. Those, for me, are the kind of partners we must attract, and there are many other examples. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, when I say Kuruangu, <laughs> Africa will be a full paying member of this God created world of ours. 
Further, my strong belief is that we will build a strong and proud identity that has been surpassed or suppressed over the last 200, 300 years. Finally, I believe that the Sadak region will be a major contributor to the vision that I expounded at the beginning. I want to thank you for giving me your time. I sincerely hope you enjoy the amazing food that Cresta has to offer. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.